Torres, sou diretor de seleção e formação de carreiras da ENAP e queria muito agradecer a presença de todos vocês para a nossa sétima edição uh, do ENAP Fronteiras e Tendências, esse projeto que a gente tem muito orgulho de tocar aqui na escola. O ENAP Fronteiras e Tendências é uma série de conversas regulares desenvolvidas num formato dinâmico e interativo para promover a discussão de temas atuais e relevantes para o governo com a participação de renomados especialistas, propiciando constante aprendizado às lideranças da administração pública. É um evento voltado para os nossos autos executivos, né, pessoas que estão em posição de liderança e que contribuem com o processo de tomada de decisão dentro do governo. E é sempre um prazer recebê-los aqui na escola. Gostaria de convidar aqui na frente nosso presidente, Diogo Costa, para anunciar o nosso convidado de hoje, e falar um pouquinho sobre o tema que a gente vai tratar daqui a pouco. Obrigado, Diogo. Obrigado, Rodrigo. É, obrigado a todos os, os presentes, as autoridades, secretários que aqui estão. É, quero agradecer é, especialmente a SAGE por ter incluído né, na sua missão de transversalidade de políticas públicas a temática de dinâmica de sistema e ter trazido o professor Karim para fazer parte desse trabalho e também por é, ter permitido a ENAP é, de participar desse projeto. É, o professor Karim Chichakli é co-presidente de IC Systems e desenvolve em software de uh, system thinking lá dentro. Ele também é um estrategista e consultor tanto para o setor público quanto privado, um professor adjunto de dinâmica de sistemas na Western Polytechnic Institute e um professor adjunto de é, ciência da computação na Capital Technical University. Ele tem uma série de, de diplomas em matemática, engenharia, ciência da computação, dinâmica de sistema é, e tem é, provocado vários momentos ahá, conforme ele conversa com diferentes é, policy makers e membros do governo sobre como pensar em, sobre seus problemas, não de uma forma tão linear e reduzida, mas de uma forma mais é, sistêmica, né, dando um zoom out, às vezes, da sua área para conseguir entender é, que as fronteiras né, dos assuntos que importam, às vezes, para resolver um problema, são muito mais amplas do que a gente percebe. É um exemplo disso que eu aprendi outro dia, por exemplo, é como que é, comércio eletrônico se preocupam com a venda de bebidas alcoólicas, mesmo sendo comércios de roupas e calçados, porque, na verdade, a compra bêbada nos Estados Unidos movimenta hoje 45 é, bilhões de dólares. E tem uma taxa de retorno menor do que a compra sobra. Então, aparentemente, as pessoas se preocupam menos. Isso faz com que é, diferentes websites tentem facilitar que pessoas bêbadas consigam concluir suas compras no site. Né? Mas é só um exemplo lúdico de quantas vezes que é importante a gente olhar para além do nosso negócio, né, quando você está vendendo apenas sapato e camisa, mas também pensar na, na compra e consumo de bebidas alcoólicas, nesse caso, para entender melhor é, o seu negócio. Outro exemplo também que agora me vem à cabeça é como que é, juízes, em alguns países, Estados Unidos, mas Israel tem alguns casos, é, precisam criar novas interpreta interpretações a partir dos emojis que são criados é, para ferramentas como o WhatsApp. Então já teve mais de um caso, teve um caso que estava vendo em Israel, de ter que se decidir se um contrato estava sendo firmado ou não pelo uso de emoji nas mensagens de texto e conferir se uma carinha rindo e uma um joinha significavam é, um, uma obrigação contratual entre as partes. É, e eu acho que nesse mundo complexo que a gente vive, então, cada vez mais é importante que a gente use ferramentas adequadas para o mundo complexo. E é isso que o professor Karim vem nos apresentar hoje. Muito obrigado, professor. The floor is yours. Bem-vindos. Boa noite. Eu sou Karim Shishakli. Eu sou americano, mas eu sou quase brasileiro que significa quase brasileira. Eu adoro o Brasil. Eu espero que eu possa ajudar o Brasil a melhor, melhorar. Um, so, I'm going to talk about 
Portuguese. Pensamento sistémico e políticos públicos em inglês. Sinto muito. Um, oh, there we go. So, I want to talk about why we even care about this. We live in a world where everything is connected to everything else, and we aren't aware of all these connections. Things reach very far away uh, from things, so we can't see what's going on and even when we do know what's going on, we have a problem for seeing what's going to happen as a result of our actions. If we uh, do this here today and something happens there tomorrow, we can't always tell what, why it happened. We end up with things that are called unintended consequences, things we did not anticipate in advance. Um, and I want to point out that these things are happening. We're, we're doing our best. We're, we're operating from our best intentions and putting our efforts into making things better and then they don't get better and we do, or they don't go the way we want them to and we don't know why. So f some examples, uh, drug arrests increase drug-related crime. You would think drug arrests would reduce crime, but it doesn't. Food aid increases starvation. Job training programs increase unemployment. Homeless shelters perpetuate homelessness. Tough crime laws do not reduce fear of crime in people. So why don't they work? Well, from what we can see and what we know, they seem like they're very obvious. This, this should work. There's no reason this should not work. Um, and when we do them, we usually see a short-term improvement. Well, we did this before, and it made a little improvement. And it really seems like it should work. So we're going to do it again. Um, but the problem is we have long-term consequences to our actions that we cannot see. We do not know what the long-term um, result will be from something that we do today. Often, we also tend to address the symptom and not the underlying problem. That's something we call fixes that fail. We, we do something, we see the symptom, we don't see the foundational problem, and we address the symptom, like if you take aspirin because you twisted your ankle. Uh, so why is the crime rate increasing? We have to think about that. I, we're putting people in jail, but the crime rate continues to increase. Why is that happening? Why does homelessness persist and increase even though we have homeless shelters? Why? Um, because we're not addressing the, fu the underlying problem. Why is unemployment so high? One thing we run into is this thing called policy resistance. So we push against our system. We say we're going to say we're going to change this. We're going to push against that system. The problem is the system is going to push back at us. So we may move it slightly this way, but then it's going to send us back to where we were. So often we have policies that don't actually do anything at all. Um, so that's a problem. I already mentioned this, but I, I want to say it again. We do not connect our well-intentioned actions in the past to the consequences we see today. We don't see the relationship. And what that happens to lead to often is we say, well, you know, this worked before, let's try it again. And sure, it did work for a short time, and then we had another problem, and we just make the system worse and worse and worse. There's a, um, that went too far, too fast. There we go. Ah. Okay, so this is a classic cartoon that shows the problem. I do this action at one day, and you know, eventually what's going to happen is I'm going to crush myself, but I don't see it coming. So this is supposed to show that um, not only are there connections that are circular in our actions, but they can come back to bite us in the future. So let me describe what systems thinking is. Barry Richmond, who's a very famous, was a very famous systems thinker. He, he's, didn't, he's no longer alive, unfortunately. He said that systems thinking is the art and science of making reliable inferences about the behavior that we're seeing by developing, developing an increasingly deep understanding of the underlying structure. And I'll talk more about that. But the key is we want to make reliable inferences about behavior that we're seeing based on the structure and learning more about the structure. Another way to look at it is we view the system as a whole. We focus on the causal relationships. Those are cause and effect relationships. Over time, and particularly we're interested in feedback and sometimes delay, because delay can, 
is very important sometimes. Why do we want to use systems thinking? Because it models ecosystems, con interconnected systems that have complex feedback. For example, this is uh, a model that Jay Forrester developed for the city of Boston originally, and it's been used for many cities. It's about urban decay and how do you recharge the cities, and he's connected the interrelationships between jobs, workforce, housing, uh, business, and land used. And he built this model, and he tried every single policy that everyone thought would work, and not one of them had any impact at all. Some of them had short-term results, but nothing worked. And every one of these policies, you would say, made total sense. The final policy he came up with was very um, controversial, and people didn't like it. But the model eventually showed that this was a huge constraint in the development of jobs in the city, that too much of the land was being used in unproductive ways, were unproductive to the economy of the city. Uh, in particular, there were a lot of favelas at the time. So it was very controversial. Um, in systems thinking, we believe that structure determines behavior. So this is the feedback structure. That's urban dynamics at the top. This is a much simpler system. In this much simpler system, we have cattle. And the more cattle there are, the more cattle are born. The more cattle are born, the more cattle there are. The more cattle there are, the more as a number will die. And the more that die will reduce the cattle. And there's a limit to how much if they're free range cattle out in my ranch, and they're just going out over, uh, they're eating on their own, the grass, then how much grass there is will determine how many cattle there can be in that area without some of them dying. So there's a limit. In this very simple structure, if you can imagine how it would behave, pretty difficult because there are four possible behaviors that you can get. The first one is equilibrium. I'm showing cattle. Cattle on the vertical axis in time. Time will always be on the x-axis for my graphs. But uh, cattle is on the vertical axis, on the y-axis. So cattle is constant. It's not changing. Um, or we can get S-shaped growth. So what's also called logistic growth. So they grow up to their limit that can be supported on the land. Or we can get um, a decrease in the population down to what can be supported by the grass if it's a little too large. Or we can get this overshoot and collapse behavior. And this overshoot and collapse behavior happens because the population grows too fast and grows beyond the ability of the land to support that population because there's extra capacity sitting there to, that allows them to grow past that limit. And then they collapse because they're too large to be sustain, sustaining themselves. This last behavior, by the way, is what uh, the book Limits to Growth in the 1970s predicted for the human population the way we're headed. Of course, a lot of things have changed since then. There are two additions since then that both say this is probably not, we're probably not gonna do this because we've been taking measures that will help. We also look at tertiary effects over long time horizons, secondary and tertiary. So we aren't just looking at, I do this and it does this, but there are other effects that can happen over time um, that are both Secondary, secondarily related and tertiary, tertiarily related. So here's an example. We're looking at uh, models, modeling dynamics over time. We have the GDP from the energy sector in Alberta, and we can see from 2000 to 2030, uh, red means there's a lot of activity, a lot of economic activity around energy there. And of course, yellow is less and green is not so much. And we can see over time, we can see what's happening here in this pattern, right? We can see we're getting a lot more intensity up here in the corner, and that's due to the uh, oil sands. It also allows us to expose our mental models. What's a mental model? It's what we think about the world, how it operates based on our experiences and our education. And if we can expose our mental models and assumptions, then we can come to a shared understanding and that reduces misunderstandings between people. Now, we just did this, by the way. I'm here, I'm here right now working with Casa Civil, and we're working on these six transversal projects, uh, and we're trying to get policy coherence be between them. But we sit in a room, and we go, OK, what do you guys think about how the system is working? And, and there are different points of view in the room, 
and the idea is to create a shared understanding of how that system works that everyone can understand and agree to. So my understanding might be about the system. If I lower my price, then I increase my demand, which increases my revenue, which increases my profit, and allows me to lower my price again after a delay, get more market share. Your point of view may be, OK, I'm going to lower my price. My revenues are going to go down. My profit's going to go down. And because of that, I'm going to have to raise my price again after a delay. OK? Very different results, very different ideas. And you can make this a coherent picture. I think about it one way, you think about it another way. Well, I can combine those together, and I can say, here's a more coherent model or an understanding of how that system works. In fact, if you think about this, I can just draw this line across here, and I've encompassed both models in one place, and we can talk about the dynamics that occur because of that. We can te safely test because we do computer simulations. We can test uh, our policies ahead of time. We can do a careful policy analysis. This is, I'm going to look at some examples in the future, but this allows us to set sliders and knobs and, and see, okay, I want to, I'm going to change this policy this much and I'll see what the results are. Um, I'm going to go over all these examples in a second, so I won't spend much time. The key aspects of uh, systems thinking are behavior over time. We are concerned about, we're always looking at time here on this axis. So we're, we care about the pattern that happens over time. We are not looking at individual events that happen. We are trying to see what the pattern was over time and why that might be. We look at feedback relationships. So if here's a feedback, simple feedback relationship. We're going to talk more about this also. But if A builds up armaments, country A, then country B will build up armaments. We'll build, so more armaments here means more armaments in this country. So that's linear thinking. We just go one way. But the problem is, if country B builds up their armaments some more, then country A will also build up their armaments some more, and we get an arms race. You can decide which countries fit in there. Um, we also are concerned with delays, which are effects of action at a distance in time. They can be very important, uh, both in perception and how quickly we, re we react, and what we uh, observe about what our actions did. We look at aggregate behavior, which means on average. We are not looking at specific individuals. Instead of looking at individual sheep and wolves, for example, which you might do in an agent-based model, we look at the population of sheep, the population of wolves. They're all in one container. The more wolves there are, the more sheep will die, because they'll get killed. The more sheep that die, will eventually lead to more wolf deaths because they'll end up killing too many sheep. You get this predator-prey uh, oscillation where the sheep are growing here and the wolves are growing with them. The wolves keep growing past where the sheep do. As they grow, they decrease the level here beyond a point where they can sustainably, sustain, sustainably continue. And then the wolves start to fall also and they get caught in this oscillations. And we see this in in nature, and we see this in many systems, including social systems. Actually, many, 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 many social systems. Uh, we can also model intangibles, and what I mean by that is we can include social variables like happiness or frustration or many other things, which you cannot do in other ways of looking at, at uh, problems. Systems thinking is the only methodology that allows that. There are many benefits for public policy. It can create a tension between current reality and future vision. You can create, you can draw a map that shows our current reality, and then you can think about what the future vision is, and you can see how, you, how they're different, and it creates that tension which allows you to uh, understand better why things are the way they are, uh, allows you to better create a roadmap to how to get there when you, over time, it also creates alignment between stakeholders. So we can use this. It's, very, it's been very, very successful to bring different stakeholders together. As I said, we're working on these six projects while I'm here for these two weeks. And we're bringing people from across the ministries together to talk about these problems. They're different stakeholders. Uh, and in some cases, they've been trying to bring in other people from outside. Uh, that's very important. And you can get a, if you have 
the stakeholders involved and you can come up with a common agenda between them, you get more buy-in and you have a better chance for success. We also can optimize the entire system instead of the individual parts. More typically, you're going to see systems, people working on little small parts here and there, but we can change the whole system. And this is really important. It encourages cooperation across departments of government or an organization and also across levels. So federal, state, local. So really important. I'm going to go over a few success stories. I showed a few examples just on that slide to show you had controls that you can change to test policies. There are hour-long presentations on each of them at that URL. Uh, I understand you'll also have access to this presentation. You don't need to write it down uh, when, the, when it gets printed, uh, published. Um, so this is a huge success story. This is a, an application from Climate Interactive that runs on your phone. And they've created models and systems that allow you to test policies for uh, reducing the increase in temperature, global temperature, between now and 2100. And their models, or 2050 in this case is two degrees for 2050, and their models have been used uh, for many, many, many of the world climate talks. So this little model lets you say, OK, how am I going to reduce greenhouse gases, how much, and what will the result of that be, and can I meet it? This is another huge success story. This is Rethink Health. They've been doing this for a long time. This is a local area in the United States where they decided the federal government was not going to solve their problem of poor health outcomes, that they needed to do something in the region themselves. And they created this simulator that lets you look at uh, a number of different areas. You can set policies across these four top four areas. And the policies for risk, for example, you can spend money to enable healthier behaviors, for example, not smoking and drinking too much or reducing crime. You can spend money to reduce environmental hazards. You can actually give money to help students get through school or to families. And you get to try these policies based on whatever area you're in. And in their area, the, the one thing that worked the best was uh, pathways uh, to advantage for students made a huge difference in the long run over the health outcomes in the area. This is a model that was used for renewable energy. So we're trying to figure out we have demand for energy and we also have wind power in particular. And so the wind is coming at certain times and it's creating reserves when we need it and then we have to go the opposite way to get the power back when we need it because of demand. So to try to balance the uh, generation from wind with the demand. I showed this picture already. This model's, this is the province of Alberta in Canada, but this model's been used in many places, and it's used for regional planning. I'm just showing GDP from the energy sector here, but this model looks at several things, including uh, conditions of the environment and biodiversity and what the population is doing, where they're moving. It's a very uh, complete model. This is another example. In the 2012 election, they thought that the Latino portion of the population was going to be the swing vote, and they were trying to predict um, what, where Obama might win, for example. So they were picking what portion of the US electorate was uh, Latino, and then how many of those were uh, Republicans. So let me introduce you to feedback, because we're, all the examples that I show you, I've already showed you some examples. They're all going to use feedback. There are two major types of feedback. Reinforcing, which gives us growth or collapse in a system. And balancing, which is seeking a goal, and it also stabilizes the system. In reinforcing feedback, we have an action. When this action increases, it ultimately leads to more of the same. Or if this action, if this decreases, it ultimately will lead to less of the same. So it continues to move in the same direction it started in when you have reinforcing feedback. We get exponential growth or we get exponential collapse. And it's virtuous when it goes the way we want it to go. It depends on the problem, whether we want it to grow or collapse. And it's vicious when it goes where we don't want it to go. 
So this is where we get vicious cycles we talk about. It's these, this is it. Balancing feedback, as I said, is stabilizes the system. It keeps it in the same place. It knows what the current state of the system is always. And if the current state changes, it acts to bring it back again. Okay, and I guess I can, it's producing internal change in the opposite direction of whichever way you're pushing it. When I talked about policy resistance, that's because of balancing loops, feedback loops in the system. So we get asymptotic growth up to a new limit or um, exponential decay to a new little limit, lower limit from that. So here are a couple of examples. We have um, bank balance. The more money I have in my bank balance, the more interest I gain, the more interest I gain, the more I have in my bank balance, the more interest I gain, the more I get, et cetera. It reinforces itself. And so we can just do it with little arrows. Bank balance goes up, interest goes up, bank balance goes up more, interest goes up more, et cetera. And we get this kind of graph, right? So our bank balance over time, we get exponential growth. In the bottom picture, we have a population. As the population gets larger, as an absolute number, more will be dying, which brings the population down. So population goes up, the number who are dying goes up as an absolute number. That brings, that tends to bring the population down some more. Because it's down some more, the number of dying goes down some more, and then it flips and goes the other way again. And you get um, this exponential decay. In this case, we'd be assuming, because it's headed towards zero, we're assuming this population whatever they were, say the cattle, they don't have uh, food anymore. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a number of examples. See how much time I have left. Um, a number of examples of how systems thinking has been used in different problems and how it explains, for example, some of the counterintuitive effects we saw at the beginning. The first one is the war on drugs. So the more drug producers we have, the more, the higher drug supply we have. The larger the drug supply, the more drug users we have. The more drug users, the more demand for drugs, and the higher the drug price, which just leads to more producers. So this is a reinforcing loop. It's not the whole picture. We're going to intervene. Look, this makes a lot of sense. The drug supply is too big. Let's wipe it out. We go in there and we blow up plantations. We arrest people and we capture stuff at the airports and we reduce the drug supply. The problem is when the drug supply goes down, the price does what? Price goes up, which induces more producers to enter the market. It makes it more lucrative for them. And that's why it doesn't work. Job creation can lead to higher unemployment. The more jobs there are, the larger the workforce. The larger the workforce, the more demand for housing. The more demand for housing, the man, more land used. The more land used, the less land is available for business. And the less land available if used for business, the fewer jobs there are. So there's a balancing feedback loop, and this is from urban, this is the urban dynamics balancing feedback loop. Well, we're gonna try to fix this by creating jobs. Well, we do have a problem because of this, that it's not gonna really do much. It's gonna push back against us if we're, if we're short on land. The other problem we have that's related to this is because we have jobs that might be available, we're gonna have unemployed people from other places coming here to try to find those jobs. And that's gonna put another press on housing which will cause more land to be used, less available for businesses, and fewer jobs. This is a model I did for the state of Hawaii. We we're looking at food production. Hawaii, they only produce 10% of their food. Everything else comes from the mainland. So they're very concerned about what might happen if they get cut off from the mainland, with good reason and um, they used to not be dependent on the mainland. They used to grow their own food. In any case, 
There's a population. As the population increases, demand grows, and uh, local, demand for local food hopefully grows also. As local demand, as demand for local food grows, production scale hopefully grows, which brings price down, which increases attractiveness of local food, which increases local demand. So that's what they want to have happen. That's what they hope can happen because there isn't demand for the local food. The local food is more expensive and there are a lot of things they can't provide anymore. People have a much wider range of appetites than they used to have 60 years ago, right? In Hawaii, anyway. As local demand goes up, the unmet demand goes up. So local demand, they have to be able to match to that. As unmet demand goes up, the amount of land needed goes up, but that's controlled by what's available and the cost of renting that land. As the amount of land goes up, production output can go up. And as production output goes up, um, there should be, a, oh, it is there. There it is. Whew. Unmet demand goes down. It's hidden right there. <laughs> In addition, the more land you're using, the more labor you need to work on that land. And that's limited by the available labor, which is another constraint. And then the more output you need, the more processing you need. And that's limited by your packing plant capacity. And then the more processing, the more distribution you need. More local demand also requires more distribution. And more distribution says lower local demand. No, that can't be right. So the more distribution you have, this must be with this. The more local demand you have, the more, I mean, the more distribution you have, the more uh, local demand you have, right? Because the issue is if it isn't in my store, I'm not going to buy it. So you need distribution needs to get to the stores. It's a fairly complex system. But we're looking at, we can then do all these policy analyses to see what happens if we run these initiatives independently. And the base case, which means we don't do anything, no policy, is in blue. And then we have several other policies here. The first one is um, food security. There's a law that was passed. And the impact of that um, is actually, you know, causes problems. You can see it here. Um, what if we can have better technology? Will that improve things? Well, look, it actually didn't improve things. What if there's a delay in processing? No, actually, wait, which way? Wait, fraction shortfall. So it did improve things. Technology did improve things, and this made it worse. Process delays make it, uh, it ends about the same. If we can't have illegal immigrants working, the large part of the labor force in Hawaii, then you can see there's a huge problem, et cetera, et cetera. Things about how much food they feed they use locally, or um, so this would be 100% of local feed, and this would be 30%, 70% is imported. It's a big problem. If they're growing feed, how can they grow crops? And can they actually grow all the kinds of feed that they need, et cetera? So there are all kinds of things. Permitting delays, we look at all those. And we can see, for example, for the starches, for example, and we look at all different food types, starches, fruits, uh, meat, dairy, uh, pork, chicken. There are tons of, uh, tons of them that we look at. But this is as an example. In starches, you can see um, the impact of the different policies at the end um, relative to each other. And you can, over here, uh, fraction of local demand not met in dairy based on the different policies. And you can also run the policies combined to see what happens. And you can see which one of these work together. So we start with the base and then we add technology. Well, technology makes it better. And then I add this legal thing we have to deal with it in the end. It's in short term, it's very bad. But in the long term, it turns out OK. We had the process delay. So this one's interesting. If there's a processing delay in the short term, look at these are months, right? So this is five years right here. In the short term, look at how bad this gets relative to the blue line. It's really bad. But in the end, it actually gets a little better. But you have this pain before things actually get better. And that's pretty common in policies. We call that worse before better behavior. And again, 
fraction of local demand not met for starches. We can see that it does get better. This is probably where we want to be for this one. And in dairy, we're getting worse. Every policy made it worse. Okay, this is a short little model that was developed by some people at TCU. They're looking at corruption and they said, the more corruption there is, the more internal controls we create. The more internal controls there are, the less corruption. However, the more internal controls there are, the more bureaucracy there is after a delay. And the more bureaucracy, the more opportunity to give bribes and therefore more corruption. Okay? So this is a fixes that fails archetype. We do, we're trying to treat a symptom and we do what we call a short term fix that's temporary that works, but then it fails. Because in the long term, in the slightly longer term, we have something that undermines it and makes it not work anymore. Some pictures being taken. This side, please. <laughs> um, okay, so how do we decide where to intervene? In this particular case, we are not looking at the fundamental solution. Okay, corruption is a symptom, it is not the problem. When I was over at CGU, they were talking to me about one of the theories they have about corruption. And um, corruption is higher in countries where there's a higher tolerance for it. And this is an, one of many accepted theories. There are many theories for corruption, but this is, if you look at the scientific literature, this is substantiated there. So it suggests, you would think, that the level of corruption can vary and that people accept what they are used to. And this, by the way, is something else we, we talk about in systems thinking. We have another system structure we talk about called drifting goals, which is also called the frog in the frying pan. As the heat goes up, this is, by the way, a myth. But the myths, everyone believes the myth, but it's not true. As the heat goes up slowly, the frog doesn't notice it and, and it ends up dying, right? That's the myth. Um, so the idea is that as things change around you, your idea of what is normal also changes and what you will accept also changes. And if you go further and you say the acceptable level of corruption in a society is everywhere in society, it's not, you know, from, you know, the, the office won't miss this pencil if I take it home to much larger things, if you say that's everywhere, then now you have something you can do. Uh, so the higher the acceptance of corruption, the more acts of corruption will occur, the lower quality of public services, which after a time will lower the acceptance of corruption. We hope. <laughs> um, the more acts of corruption, the fewer opportunities for corruption which brings us into balance again, so there will be fewer acts of corruption. But the higher acceptance of corruption, the more opportunities there will be. So if you look at that diagram and you try to run a little model where um, acts of corruption start to increase, the acceptance follows it, which suggests that one way to fight this is to force this down artificially, and CGU does this through education. I don't know if you know that. In the United States, we have the war on terror. I'm terrified of the war on terror. I don't know what to do about it. I should have a war on the war on terror. <laughs> but the idea behind the war on terror, and this is nothing new, by the way. This is what I'm going to show you. We were telling them before this happened. Uh, so. The, it's not, this is not like we're looking back and here's what happened. We were looking forward and saying this is what's going to happen. The more terrorists there are, the more terror attacks there will be. The more terror attacks there are, the more military reprisals. The more military reprisals, the fewer terrorists. 
Hooray, that's it. We did it. We solved the problem, everybody. Let's go home. Here's where the problem comes in with every one of these things. So, you know, you ask the military people, what is the most obvious thing to do? We're going to eradicate the terrorists. We're going to go in there. We're going to take them out. We're done. Mission accomplished. Go home. Okay, how many years has it been? They're still there. Um, part of the problem is they didn't look at the whole system. The more military reprisals, the more collateral damage. Who knows what that means? Does everyone here know what collateral damage means? Yeah, it's a nice word for civilian deaths. Isn't that a nice word? We don't care about civilian deaths. They're, they're not people. They're collateral damage. They're chairs we threw out in the trash. Doesn't matter. I mean, this is just horrible. Why do they use words like this? We're killing people. We're killing citizens. But we're just going to, eh. It's collateral damage. What can we do about it? There's a lot they can do about it, actually. But the more collateral damage they, that there is, the more people are against you. The more people who are against you, after delay, the more terrorists there are. And that's why it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't look at the whole system. Very short-sighted. OK? So it has this unintended consequence of growth in terror attacks. Let's look at the question of homelessness. I said homeless shelters perpetuate homelessness. This is another, by the way, common system structure. So the more homeless people there are, the more temporary shelters and support we'll give them, which reduces the number of homeless people. So far, so good, right? At least there are fewer, there are fewer of them on the streets. They're off the street. This is a very humane policy. OK, the more homeless people there are, maybe we should be thinking about building permanent housing for them and critical services and getting them employment. So there really are fewer homeless people, right? We're, now, we're no longer just getting them off the street. We're trying to solve their problem. Unfortunately, we don't do that. Because of these temporary shelters, the problem visibility goes down. The problem visibility goes down. The pressure to make fundamental shifts go down. And we don't do this. We don't do this. This is. This is solving the fundamental problem. And we're not doing it because of that. Well, not just that. Let's keep going. That was not supposed to all come up at once, was it? Well, I guess so. OK, so the more shelters there are, the more funding to individual organizations who do those shelters. And those people who are donating their money, they want short-term results. I want so many beds filled per time. The more funding they have, the less willingness they have to work and collaborate with each other. We'll see this message again in Brazil in a second. OK? The more money that they have for their organization, the less willing they are to collaborate and work for more innovative solutions with others, which again undermines our ability to solve the problem. This is called shifting the burden. And the thing that's special about it is we end up doing things, we end up doing short-term solutions that make it very difficult to solve the problem. We don't, we're not doing it on purpose, right? We're trying to do things we can. As I said, if I go back to the slide, this is humane. We're not having them sleep out on the streets when it's zero degrees, right? OK. Brazil. Uns problemas do Brazil. Anyway, education. So there's fragmentation at the federal, state, and municipal levels. So what this causes is overlap in what people are doing. There are missed opportunities. The objectives don't get met. Stop clicking twice. So at the federal level, they're dealing with infrastructure. So they'll build busings, they'll bus buildings, they'll provide buses. And at the state and municipal level, they have to deal with human resources and materials. And what this does is you run into these kind of problems. And this, this is a real problem, by the way, that happened uh, a couple years ago. The federal government buys buses, a bunch of buses, and sends them to wherever they were supposed to go. As far as the federal government is concerned, they did their job. We fixed the problem. However, 
at the local level, they, they don't have any money allocated for bus drivers. They don't have any money allocated for fuel for those buses. And those buses just sit there, and they sit there, and they sit there. So they can't use the resource because it's not a coordinated effort across the levels. And it's not unique to education. I mean, schools is still education. I was given examples where they built a school, big school for I forgot how many millions. It was never occupied. It was built in a place, first of all, that was far away from where the children were. So how did they get them there? But they also didn't have the money to make it work. And also, at the same time as this bus thing, I don't know if you guys remember, it was all over the news, there were a bunch of urgent care facilities throughout Brazil that were built. And they're empty. They weren't hundreds, I'm talking hundreds, were built, which is great. Bravo, 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 federal government. I'm not saying that's not the problem. That's a very good move. Problem, it's not coordinated. They never got equipped. They never got staffed. Hopefully now they are. I don't know if they are. Gracias a Deus. It's two years later. I hope they are. Um, <clears throat> but the problem is there's no coordination across the levels. And there's no commitment for specific objectives that are holistic. Okay? The objectives themselves are fragmented. And <laughs> this killed me, right? We're not looking at educational outcomes directly. So the federal government is out when those buses are delivered. There's no further educational objective that says they should be following up on something to make sure those buses are used, for example. Inconsistent priorities, just another effect. And the, the final result is we don't meet the objectives that are set out. So they. Um, developed this image. This is people uh, people who worked on this, by the way, were across all levels. We got them all in the same room and worked on this problem. Uh, so it's in Portuguese. Can I read it? No, just kidding. So the more regulation we have and the more control we have, the more multi-level coordination we have. I have to warn you, this was done at TCU, so it's going to have a little slant to it. Um, the more multi-level coordination there are, the more consistent priorities you have, the more your plan is consistent with the PNE, right? BNEA, the more efficient management you have, and the more efficient control you have. So I just mean, because it's a TCU, control is going to keep coming up. <laughs> the more control you have, the less corruption you have, the less corruption you have, the more efficient um, management you have. Now, of course, we, we know if this gets to be too much, we're in trouble. But it, it, they qualified it, efficient control. Today, they were talking more about intelligent control. Um, but same thing. All of these things can come together to improve our realization of these objectives Okay, for the state. All of these things improve it. Efficient control, efficient management, plan being consistent with that, and consistent priorities. All of those things can help that. Now. Oops, wrong way. It's that way. If those objectives are not met, there can be repercussions in the media, from society, protests in the street, and that can act to make you or encourage you to have more consistent priorities, which can then help you meet the objectives. Transparency can, higher transparency uh, can improve the repercussions. If you don't meet the objectives, they know about it and they can tell you. And transparency can improve control. If you do meet the objectives, then you have a higher quality of education and your repercussions go down. You actually have positive press, one hopes, and no protests. If they aren't met, then you have sanctions. And so the more sanctions you have, the less resources you have, and the less ability you have to meet those goals. That's a problem. Does everyone agree that's a problem? So I can't meet my objectives in my state. What happens? 
I get sanctions. What do sanctions mean? They take resources away from me. It's guaranteed I can't meet my objectives going forward. So they give me more sanctions. And they make it harder for me to meet the goal. So that's a problem. That has to be broken and fixed. Okay. I'm going to skip this one only because of time. Ba, 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 ba. But the interesting thing, I will tell you very quickly, this was in health. And uh, backwards, backwards, backwards. The interesting thing here is, are these things. So the more collaboration there was, the more financial resources were available. But they said the more fan financial resources were available to them, the less they would collaborate. That's a problem. The more they collaborated, the higher quality of the service. The higher the quality of the service, the more power was invested in local politicians and the less they'd collaborate for political reasons. So that was the reality. This is what they wanted. You'll notice in this picture, they, they took out the politicians. They're not here anymore. The more money they have, the more they collaborate. The higher the quality of service, the more they collaborate. That was their vision for where they wanted to go. So we have the tension between where they are and where they were trying to go. And then they could communicate that. This goes on for a long time. OK. I'll go over these last two for sure. And that's all. then we're done. So public safety. I think everyone's aware of the high homicide rate in Brazil. And when we met, um, these were reasons that were given for that, OK? So why are we having a high homicide rate? Let's look at this. And then they came up with this, these pictures. This is what the homicide rate is doing. And by the way, this was a while ago, and it has continued to do this. And this is what they're hoping for it to do. That's what they want it to do. This is the clearance rate for murders, flat. What they wanted to do is get better. This is the conviction rate for murder. <laughs> Not good. Um, and this is recidivism, pretty constant at that time. And they wanted to go down. So they came up with this very interesting picture. The more gang members there are, the more access to guns. The more access to guns, the higher the homicide rate. The higher the homicide rate, the more cases are solved. Gracias a Dios. Uh, the higher the prison population, the higher the recidivism, which leads to a higher homicide rate. The um, higher the prison population, look at this. The higher the prison population, the larger number of gang members we have. So if you stop right here, this is a reinforcing loop. This is a vicious cycle. By the way, this is a vicious cycle too. And this is a vicious cycle. We don't want vicious cycles. We want virtuous ones, or we don't want them at all. And at this point, they already realized, before we went any further, they already realized just from this much that if they don't first improve the prisons, they shouldn't even bother to improve police capacity to solve crimes or toughen the crime laws. Toughening the crime laws is just going to make this worse, isn't it? And so they've, they've done some work in here since then. I do know that to try to improve that. Okay, the other thing you have going on here is, is you know, the higher the homicide rate, the higher the policing, police and gang deaths, the higher the police and gang revenge. There's another vicious cycle. We got all this other stuff going on. Okay? Higher the poverty, more gang members. Lower presence and quality of services, higher gang members. And that's in the neighborhoods. For example, in the favelas, if there's no security there. Higher presence and quality of services, lower inequity, uh, higher social stability, fewer robberies, so fewer cases to solve. But it actually is the other way. Lower presence and quality of services, higher inequity, uh, lower social stability, more robberies. And we're back into that same cycle again. OK. Uh, the gang members reduce the presence and quality of services. 
and lower uh, presence in quality services leads to more poverty. Okay, and this is controversial. Corruption reduces presence in quality services, but this part is, is controversial. Let's walk through this. The higher the state investment, the higher the presence of quality of services, the lower the poverty, the higher the state investment. That's not controversial, I hope. The lower the state investment, the higher the presence in quality and services. No. Lower state investment, lower presence in quality, higher poverty, lower state investment. <laughs> Excuse me. This is the government giving up in some neighborhoods. Because they don't think they can do anything. Well, we can't fix that. We'll go work over here instead. More state investment, better efficiency to solve crimes, fewer gang members, and more cases solved. Corruption gets in the way of that, of course. Higher state investment leads to efficiency of the judicial system. Corruption interferes with that. More convictions, more convictions. Uh, there also have to be cases solved. But the more convictions, the less impunity, and the lower the homicide rate. And then the last connection here is the higher the homicide rate, the higher the state investment, we hope. And so they wanted to work in these areas, right? So we took away this, we wanted to break this link, and we wanted to break this link between poverty and gang violence. This other one was to break that other loop. They also wanted to break this, but it's actually this link here, gang members to reduce presence and quality of services. Corruption, yeah, okay. The last problem I'm gonna look at, hopefully I don't run over, but we had this big project in socioeconomic inclusion. There are 50 million citizens, that's a quarter of your population, who are vulnerable in terms of education, sanitation, health, security, and opportunity. Their goal is to try to meet the SDG goals. I don't know if you know what those are, but they basically want to reduce inequality and poverty around 2030 is the time frame. 10 to 15 years, well, 2032, I don't know, 2033. But what they observed is that a very small fraction of the current programs that are used to do this permanently improve people's lives. We're not getting results. We're investing money, they're not getting results. And there are several failure modes. So we have this Bolsa Familia problem program, right? Family support is only given if the children go to school. But because a lot of the schools aren't up to the standards they should be, the educational goals are not being met, right? It's a good program. It's designed to help people, but you don't, you're not meeting the educational goals. And there isn't a performance requirement of quality in the schools, which is a big problem. There's corruption and false reporting. Children don't actually go to school, but they're reported to go to school. There's no minimum requirement for student performance. And everyone gets promoted automatically to the next level, whether they passed or they didn't pass. So where's your education goal getting met there? It's not. 90% of schools are half day. What does that mean about the afternoons? It means it's an opportunity for them to join gangs, which we don't want them to do. Okay, microcredit and small business support. The failure mode here is the businesses don't register, so you never collect taxes from them. That's a problem. They become informal. You have problems in some programs where um, beneficiaries feel entitled to the money that they're getting. You can't change it. You're locked in. It's now, they consider it their income, not a benefit they're getting from welfare, but it's, their, it's actually their income. I'm getting paid by you to stay at home or whatever. I don't know how they think about it. Skills training. So to allow people to move out of poverty and have better jobs, they don't ever reach the poorest people. These mostly help, these programs mostly help the lower middle class. And the reason for that, still about 25% of your population, they're functionally illiterate or they're illiterate. That means they cannot read posters that advertise the courses. They don't even know they're happening. They can't succeed in any course that requires reading and writing, which most of them do. 
They can't fill out their applications. Big problem. And less than 7% of that population have basic math skills. So this rules out any job that requires math skills. And the target jobs for these programs tend to be retail, construction, domestic work. So they're not going to be working in retail if they don't have basic math skills. They're not even going to understand it. The other failure mode is there's resistance here to, parent, to literacy in parents. Parents don't always see the need for it. So this, this is a little smaller map, and this is the last one we're going to look at. The higher the vulnerable population, the lower the overall educational level, uh, the fewer formal opportunities, the less formal income, and the more vulnerable population you have. Family support reduces vulnerability, and the labor market provides more formal opportunities. The lower the formal income, the more cash transfers there are, and the less vulnerable the population is. Political interest increases cash transfers. But the more the cash transfers, the less incentive to work or get educated. So the educational level goes down. Cash transfers enable informal income, because now I have some money to do something on the side. But that reduces vulnerable population. That's good. But it also reduces the incentive to work, at least formally, or get educated. Informal income reduces formal income, which is what's taxed. Here's the benefit. Cash transfers increase children in school, which increases after delay the education level. Assume we're not, we don't fall into those failure modes. Cash transfers also increase the health level overall, which makes it possible for more formal opportunities and also for improving education level. You can't go to school regularly if you're sick all the time. Basic public services improve both the health level and education level, as does education quality. Public basic, uh, in better basic public services means, means better sanitation, which means better health. Higher vulnerability in population, though, means lower sanitation and lower health. Finally, the higher the vulnerable population, the um, less security there is there, and the more vulnerable the population is. Okay, so that's the end of the map. So what can you do about this? Well, they focus on things like trying to move people away from a dependence on cash transfers. If you have a dependence, that's called a shifting the burden archetype. And it's hard to break that. So they're, they, one of the things they want to do is try to move away from that. They wanted to try uh, and also break this, these cycles, like to, from incentive to, get work or edu to work or get educated. They wanted to do some more stuff in education to increase the quality and security as well. OK. So systems thinking in general is useful in these situations that I describe here, which I'll tell you. OK. If we have chronic problems with lower than expected success, if we have short-term games that hide long-term uh, same or worse behavior, so let's say long-term consequences, if the problems are complex, if the solution is known, everybody talks about, oh, this is the solution, I know it, but it never gets implemented, that's a systems thinking problem. To successfully change the system, you have to understand it. And you also have to understand your own role in perpetuating that system. To change it, you may have to give something up. So what is our own role? You know, they're maybe talking about a system that's far removed from me. What is my own role? Well, maybe I know something is happening that's wrong, and I'm not doing anything to help it. Right? Isn't the seventh level of hell reserved for those who know? Something is wrong and they do nothing. This is our basic premise. The feedback structure of the system is what determines the behavior. It's not, you know, something happened outside the system that pushed it that caused the behavior. Sure, things outside come in like a drought, but how the system responds is based on its feedback structure and you can make it more resilient. And in fact, um, 
We use balancing loops to stabilize reinforcing loops that are growing out of control or collapsing too fast. And we can also use balancing loops to create policy resistance. I mean, they do always create policy resistance. What I meant to say is we can design them to create policy resilience, which is what we want. Okay. Perguntas? Muito obrigado pela sua atenção. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I do it in, in Portuguese for, for the rest of the... Okay? Um, em alguns momentos uh, fica claro para a gente como uh, os sistemas... Os problemas nem sempre são facilmente compreensíveis, eles são complexos. Uh, mas nos sistemas há muitas relações causais né? entre... Um, um fato e outro, ou entre uma causa e uma consequência, enfim. Uh, como não errar nas relações causais? Ou seja, como não ter uh, 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 premissas erradas ao, ao montar um sistema? So this is a very good point. We are building a theory for how we think the system works. And our goal is to build a theory that represents our best understanding. And to get the best understanding, we need to include people who are experts with that, or people who are living it. If we get the right people together, then we're going to be much more confident about that. And we can sit there and we can say, okay, by the way, I do this all the time. Someone will say, I, uh, this cause leads to that effect. I'll go, I don't think so. Do you guys think so? Who thinks so? Oh, hands go up, other people go, I don't know, I don't know. So. You, you work in a group and you work cooperatively to try to come to a better understanding that's holistic for all of your views and that all of you can appreciate and say that, yes, that's how it's structured. There are also, um, there are articles at times, you know, research articles that can help, but I prefer to work from the people who are, unless, you know, unless I think someone's going really astray, I prefer to work from the people who are living in the system and, and work with the system because they know it best. Their system is going to be different from whatever was was uh, published. For example, we had that example. So I presented that example at a conference and everyone, you know, no, wait, stop, stop, professor. That's not right. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. That's not right. I would say that's not right. However, this was the point where they the less money was invested as poverty went up. And I said, but that's the situation they're living. That's the reality. That's what's really happening. Sure, that's not what you expect to happen. And that's not what good governance should lead to. But that is what's happening. So that's, that's the effect. If you looked at the literature, you'd say that's completely wrong. So you really have to work with the people there. And you have to consistently go back and say, OK, does this make sense? Let's walk through it again. Does this make sense? Is something missing? Can we say, and every time you do that, so we did these projects, we spent a, a full day. And we did two half days. But we did two half days so that they have time after they develop a theory to think about it and think about whether it's actually correct or if they think something's been missed or something needs to be added. And I can't tell you how many times I asked them to walk through this and walk through this, and the more times you go through someone, oh, wait a minute, I don't think that's right. Okay, explain why that's not right. And what do you, the rest of you think? Do you guys come up, do you guys agree with that? We're trying to come up with our best understanding, and if that is a representation of our best understanding, that's better than we were before, even if something turns out to be wrong. Hi, thank you for your seminar. 
Uh, but then after you have the, the, the system designed with all these people, you have to go and look for data to corroborate the causal effects or the, <coughs> the perception, right? That's why uh, we're, we're, aren't we talking about um, um, public policy based on evidence? See, there is evidence. So Jay Forrester says the, mo the largest source of data that we have and that we rarely tap is what is in people's minds. So we are using the knowledge and experience of the people who are involved in the situation. Now, if we go further, we, at, at, we do have, if we want to do a simulation, like for example, if we go back to, I'm playing a little fast and loose. If we go back to, actually, it's probably faster if I do this. Did I already go by? No, here it is. So if we go back to this, OK? There's a ton of data that I had to collect to run the simulation model. There's a ton of data I had to verify. And you know what's really eye-opening? There was no consistency in any of that data. Every source I asked for data gave me a different answer. The numbers did not match. So I, again, I still had to use my educated guess and ask experts, what do you think is really more correct in these numbers because we don't have the real numbers. They don't really exist. We're collecting more and more data and it's flawed. It's completely flawed. So again, I get back to talking to people. As I built this model up, I talked to a lot of experts. What do you think? I did look for research articles. What did, what did they say about how it works? By the time, so by the time I get to a simulation model, I'm very concerned about um, the accuracy underneath, and I'll try to verify whatever I can. And I will also, for this model, we wanted pre predictive power. We don't really do predictive power, but more or less, as much as we could do. And right, because this is another point. I can predict what's going to happen tomorrow much more easily than I can predict what's going to happen 10 years from now. There's going to be much more divergence from the reality 10 years from now than tomorrow. So you want to be closer. I'm predicting out to 23, actually 10 years here. That was 10 years. So again, you try to find sources that can support the arguments. Uh, you try to find, uh, you discuss it with people to see, does this make sense? I think that's evidence. There's evidence there when you're discussing, we talk to experts, people who are living it or in the system or have studied it or building policy around it and they've worked with it. There's evidence there. And there's, I think that's the strongest pool of evidence. There is evidence from data and a lot of things, we look at policy failures from the past and we look at policy successes from the past and you, those are, that's very important data. You say, why did that work or why didn't that work and what could we do differently and will we run into that same problem? That's, I think that's evidence also. So, you have to be very careful with data though. On this project, oh my God, I, I, everything. There were at least three conflicting reports on the actual data, and they weren't even close to each other. Professor Karim, uh, I, 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 I could speak in English, but I prefer in Portuguese. Okay. Uh, parece que há uma convergência dos sistemas uh, complexos, né? Da das e também da, da, do governo aberto, no sentido de que, de que cada vez mais uh, a, os sistemas estão ficando cada vez mais complexos, exigem, uh, e com mais variáveis, exigem uma interpretação maior e de mais visões e mais itens que, de, que dificultam uma, um grupo, um único grupo participar. Então a gente vê isso, vê isso realmente no dia a dia, conforme os exemplos que o senhor comentou. E, e agora, por exemplo... Uh, é, a, a gente percebe que muitas vezes a, a população ela concentra seu foco numa tecnologia, por exemplo, hoje se, hoje se fala muito no 5G, mas a questão não é o um 5G, porque porque por exemplo os Estados Unidos e, os, e, e grandes grupos já estão com autorização para lançar 
milhares de microsatélites que vão se interconectar e já estão se discutindo como tratar as informações, as bilhões de informações que vão circular para esses, para esses satélites para, por exemplo, trazer prosperidade no campo nos Estados Unidos. Então, quer dizer, e para voltar à questão voltar a população das cidades para o campo, porque se no, nos anos 70 a população saiu não só no Brasil, no mundo inteiro saiu do campo para, para as cidades existe a tendência de voltar usando tecnologias de IoT etc. Então quer dizer a, a, essas, novas, essas novas formas de pensar é, de, os problemas elas são complexas a gente, a gente fica aqui meio boca aberto mas são, são ferramentas necessárias para que a gente possa explorar e possa chegar em resultados mais efetivos. É exatamente isso. Muito obrigado. I hope you'll use it and learn more about it. Ok. Thank you, Professor. I, I want to um, complement the point that the lady made about uh, the, the problems with data, because there are some issues where there is more consensus among Same. experts and people live in the field, but there are also some issues where you find a lot of disagreement. Uh, so when it comes to um, security, for instance, So uh, this year we've seen a 22% drop in uh, homicide rate in the country and in every month uh, almost, so this is the average. Uh, but it's very hard for you to find a consensus on what exactly has caused this. Same. And if we look at some of the, the elements that uh, were brought up, um, maybe there weren't a change of those elements that much, but you saw a, a, a change in the crime rate. So. Um, when when this kind of things happens, and it's also complex systems, and not only we're looking at the problems, but also at you know things that are working. But why are they working? Uh, how do we manage to to do this without you know going and and trying to f to to do these messy studies of casualty and find these continuities and 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 going through you know to the experts to try to resolve the, the conflict and the, the, the difference of opinions. So you want to do it without going to experts? Is that what you're asking me? Oh, my, my question is, um, be, oh, in, during that uh, exchange, one, one of the things was that, okay, so we get a lot of data, but then it sometimes it's too messy, so it's, it's good to look at people on the ground who have a, 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 a first-hand experience with the problem. When it comes to violence, I think if you go to the favelas, people won't tell you exactly what happened. Uh, they don't know, you mean. And exactly. So how, how do you go about uh, trying to see what actually works in this kind of cases? So one of the things that you do is, is you're focusing on the overall causations within the system, right? And if you create a comprehensive uh, description of what's going on around the homicide rate, for example, in fact, uh, we just developed a map, a new map on that, um, then you can try to see, okay, So what's causing this? Now, that's a good question, but I want to back up even more. You're saying the crime rate has been falling month by month for how long? Since the beginning of the year? Or a little later? Less than a year. So is that enough data to say it's falling? Or is there an anomaly going on? Is there something that's something else that's causing it? I, it's very hard, I think, to reach a conclusion over a short interval of time about what something's doing. I, I don't have the picture here, but I have, I have a picture of the, I do have it somewhere, but I don't have it right here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> average global temperature. It's like doing this, right, forever. And then all of a sudden we hit somewhere in the 80s and it goes like this, or early 90s, and it starts going like this. Everybody goes, oh, it stopped, it's not happening anymore. And this happens for, I don't know, five or six years. In the scheme of things, that's not very much. And then it goes, whoop, faster. <laughs> so I'm always hesitant to say something's improved for, for, you know, without a wider time frame, without a wider time horizon. You can look at 
Um, you can try to develop a theory for what's causing the homicide rate, and then you can look at things in there that may have changed, that might be reducing it. No one knows, I know, we just met the other day and they're like, well, it's been falling a little, we don't know. There were different theories that were thrown out, but no one knows. How do you know? So when you get stuck with that, here's what we do. Nobody knows how it works, but we can simulate models on computers, which is not what we were doing in this classes because that's a more advanced subject. We only had a, a short time. Um, but it, you can build a model for each of the alternate theories. You can say, okay, is, what do you think, Pedro? Oh, I think it's such and such. Uh, what do you think, Giogo? Oh, I think it's such and such. So we can actually build the computer model and say, okay, if we change that, does it actually change the homicide rate? Does it make a difference? Um, and we typically do that. We'll build alternate theories of how people think things work. If people can't agree, for example, we'll build a theory that looks at this, a theory that looks at this, a theory that looks at this, and then have people talk about those theories. Do you think these things still make sense? Or we may try to create an integrated theory that that's harder without input, that we can then try different policies against and see what happens. So there's a great power in computer modeling and simulation to let you investigate these things, because you can't go out there and test it, unfortunately. Again, the computer model is limited by what our concept of how the thing works. And that's where you can get the broadest view possible is going to help you. Just a follow-up question. Because um, one of the, the new ideas is that, I, I don't like this sentence, but people say that, you know, you, you can have models without a theory because you just throw a lot of data in the computer and then it just uh, uh, pushes out different kinds of, of uh, relationships. And although I, d I don't like this, but still, if you look at the universe, if you look at, at uh, crime in special, uh, you will find a lot of papers that attribute the fall of homicide rates in, in the United States since the mid-90s. You find papers that attributing this to the rise of uh, cell phones that allowed drug transactions to happen remotely without the need for you know, street fights and street turf fights. You find papers uh, relating the drop in um, um, lead in in fuels. Uh -huh. uh, you find papers talking about the, you know, uh, Levitt's famous for this, the the abortion laws in in the 70s and how that changed. So it it becomes you know a huge universe. So maybe we should actually uh, use more of you know, machine learning and big data and these kind of things to to look at things that we cannot, you know, we're not conscious, aware of, and, and it's very hard to, to become intuitive about these things. What is wrong with big data and machine learning? Does anyone know? It's based on statistics, statistical regression. Statistical regression tells us there's correlation. And if you took any statistics course, it should have been hammered into your head. Correlation is not causation. Causation requires carefully sets of ex carefully designed experiments to establish. You can't establish them through some statistical thing. What the statistical things let you do is say, well, perhaps there's a relationship here, and now I can actually go scientifically try to prove it. Okay, but the statistics mean nothing. And what we find, so I did a project with IBM, uh, like all that, all those long projects I talked about that are on there that I said you can go look at the hour-long presentations. That was part of a project I did with IBM. We were doing a project to look at why big data was failing. IBM, it's a big market. They sell big data. And they want to know why big data is failing. And the reason why big data is failing is because big data is based on statistics. Statistics is based on past regressing forward in time from past data, which means we're assuming that the conditions that were in the past are going to remain exactly the same in the future. And if we think about statistics, let's think of this sobering fact for a moment. According to statistics, the probability of the 9-11 attacks on the United States was zero. According to an SD model that looks at the causation, cause and effect, the probability was much higher than zero. So IBM's problem is they would sell big data to some customer and they would say, and the big data would say, okay, this is what you should do. This is going to really help things. They would do that, 
And, and it would also predict what results they get. And they would get these results. They wouldn't get these results. Because once they started changing, they're part of an independent, connect, interconnected system. Once they start changing, all their competitors start changing too. They're not dumb. And so their results aren't like this, they're like this. So we worked on this project because they wanted to try to tie big data into uh, system dynamics models so that we could then uh, simulate the interdependent outcomes so we could see whether or not the solution would actually provide the benefit that they said over, over the time frame they needed to get their investment back. We didn't finish that project because it's still a research project. In fact, the US government has invested in working that project. We're still slightly involved in that. But it's a pretty serious research investment in order for, to have uh, a big data analysis then turn into do a model of cause and effect that can then uh, give me some indication about what's gonna happen. That's a huge, huge problem, an AI problem, right? Not just machine learning, it's a true AI. I don't call machine learning AI, it's a misnomer. It's just a quick follow on to, uh, if you're not using statistics, statistics, then what techniques are you using? What, what sort of models are you, uh, do underlie your simulations? And I'm sorry that I wasn't here right That's at okay. the beginning, so I'm not, so, not sure that you mentioned that at some point in time. Yeah, we did. Um, but um, since you, you said statistics again, I will just mention what Mark Twain said. There are three kinds of lies in increasingly, in increasingly worse order. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. You can make statistics say anything you want to say. I know that. I taught statistics for 10 years. You can make statistics say anything you want it to say. Um, our underlying uh, premise is causation. We develop cause and effect relationships and we simulate what happens based on those cause and effect relationships. We model how the system is actually constructed and how it works. We don't model regressions based on data from the past. Therefore, so here's a very simple example. So are we talking hierarchical models? Well, a hierarchy has nothing to do with it. You can create them hierarchically or not. I don't think that's relevant. Um, but let me give you an example. Oh, I can't. This isn't my computer. Ha, huh, it's not on here. So there's a famous statistical model, econometric model from the US that predicts uh, milk production. And it predicts it from GDP and interest rate and a bunch of other economic variables. So that's a traditional statistical approach, and that's what you're going to see in big data also. It fails under many cases. It doesn't talk about how it works. What do you need to get milk? How can you get milk? Cows. If you don't have cows, you can't have milk. There's no cows in that model. What if there's hoof and mouth disease, which there was in England? All of a sudden, pff, there goes the model. It's not right. It's wrong. We build models about how things actually work. So they're trying to be scientific models of cause and effect wherever we can establish them. And if we can't, it's what people involved in the situation best believe about how it works. Yep. OK, so, thanks. So, and so it might be the difference if you're familiar with scientific process-based models. They're more or less like what we do, very similar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, we're having good discussions here, but uh, it's time to, to go home. I would like to, to say that we appreciate a lot that you are here with us for this evening. Um, I think we are going home with a lot of reflections about how to think about the, the public problems. So it's very important for us. So thank you again. Uh, vocês, muito obrigado.